here once again with the Emissary Publishing Podcast, where we talk with authors who have gone through the process of distilling all of their thoughts into a book. Uh, and my friend, colleague, and partner here, uh, Paul, welcome. Jason, great to be with you again. Great to, uh, really excited about today's episode. I get to bring on a personal friend, a mentor, my, my very own, uh, my very own rabbi, Rabbi Darren Katz. He's based in New Zealand. Uh, he's written one. I, I don't think this is his first book, but it's the one that he most recently wrote called Strange Gospel. And uh, we're going to dig into <clears throat> the importance of telling the whole story, because as you've mentioned in the past, right, when you don't tell the whole story, people tend to make up the details on their own. And all of a sudden, interpretations go sideways and communication breaks down. And then we got bigger problems on our hands. All right. Well, welcome to the show, uh, Rabbi Katz. How are you? Shalom. Good, good in you guys. If I, if I can just say this, it's quite an honor to be called an author. I don't think um, I've had that happen too often yet. Not that I haven't authored, but it's nice to be officially seen as such by a company like yours. So thank you. It's quite, a, quite an honor. Well, I've had the opportunity to dig into your book, Strange Gospel, and I, I think it's pretty fascinating. So, I, and, and I also think that the process of going through uh, producing a book, writing a manuscript, even if it's not even, uh, yet published, uh, is, a, is a process of concentrating thoughts, yeah. ta taking out things that don't belong and making sure we do say the things that do belong. And I think there's a, there's a process of clarification even for oneself in in becoming an author. Yep. You know, you mentioned that if I can tell you funny enough, this morning I was writing commentaries on it, like little teasers, I would say, uh, that I put on Quora. And I feel like to the people I've sold the book to already, and there are a few, when I say a few, I mean a few in terms of just my own personal selling of the book, that I need to say, what kind of chocolate or food do you enjoy so that when I offer you a fourth version of the book that's been revised, even after this morning again, that you're not going to run away from the book. So exactly what you're saying, and I think it's an experience that I'm discovering is so vitally important because I always used to wonder why books have so many editions. I understand now. I understand why an author would come back to something they wrote a few years back and say, I think I want to say a little bit more, or take this out or replace that. So exactly what you've just mentioned is what I'm experiencing currently with the book. And since we're talking about what needs to be left in and what needs, what needs to get in there and what needs to be kept out, Rabbi, um, as, as a student of uh, the, the Hebrew Bible, as well as the gospels and the writings of the apostles and what is mo known contemporarily as the new Testament, boy, there's a lot of stuff in there that I've learned from studying with you that you wonder why is that in there? And then you, there's other stuff that you're like, why doesn't it say anything about this? And I think that maybe that's a good way to sort of begin to s spark the conversation about, you know. Um, cause we are talking about telling the whole story. We do want to give the audience something that creates an impact and moves them in a certain direction. So let's start there and just wait, wait, what is, what have you found or what, or what's been revealed to you about what's in the Bible and what's not and, and how they decided that? Well, that's a great question because I think in that probably pretty much summarizes my work over two decades now. And I'm going to say this specifically with Gentile believers in Jesus. And I've got to choose my words carefully because I get torn to pieces on Cora as being claiming that I'm an undercover Christian because I so often talk to Christians, not exclusively, but often, oftentimes to them. And I think in my time of working with Christians for the last 20 years, I love investigating and I love getting to the quickest point possible in getting somewhere on, on a theme, not to waste time. So after listening to Christians for so many years, I came to the conclusion, and I think it's what makes me both famous and infamous on, on Cora, is that I think the cross in terms of the gospel is overrated 
in the bigger picture in the sense that it gets pushed too far to the front at the expense of everything else. Mm -hmm. And that's where your statement comes in because a lot of Christians I speak to wonder why this story is in there, as you noted, or why is that in there? And then why is not more said on this or said on that? And I think the simple answer, which doesn't always get well received at first by our audience, is to say, well, honestly, the gospel was never actually even written to you. Yeah. So you've got to take a humble step back and say, well, the original audience heard the stories and had access to information that is not readily available today, especially if people refuse to read anything outside of the Gospels. Mm. As such. And so that creates all kinds of unnecessary problems. And what makes that, for me, particularly contradictory on the part of the people who are reading that and are telling me is, and again, I'm going to point out Christians because they're the ones that say it so often, is that's a bit of a hypocritical statement because your pastor makes analogies every Sunday in church and you read it and you accept it, which you can, I'm not saying you can't, that's extra biblical what he's doing. And it's yeah. okay as a premise. So I think for what it is for me, what I've noticed is on both those sides, on the one hand, again, because Christians, and I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm downplaying the cross because I absolutely believe in the cross and the necessity of what happened. I think what I'm saying is, to, to Christians especially, and to Jews, let me not say it's not to Jews, is to say, basically, don't let the Christian gospel block you from finding Jesus, which sounds terrible to say, but it is honestly what I want to say, because there are extra bits. For example, why is Jesus obsessed with talking about death and resurrection? To a Christian, yes, it seems, oh, that's just because it saves us from sin. No problem. That concept is there. But what about the Lord of the dead? What about the pagan concepts of the dead at the time? That's what gives the cross a whole new level of meaning, or not new, old level of meaning, that we need to put back in there. And mm -hmm. on the side, oh, why isn't this explained in detail? Well, because the authors are assuming you grew up in a synagogue yeah. where you learn about Jasher. You know, you'd learn about all of these other concepts. And when you go and read those, that's why I encourage people to read the book of Enoch. Light bulbs go off for them because they wait a minute, that sounds like something I read in the gospel. To which I then say, yes. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that in a summary is how I'd, how I'd figure out both sides, what's had to be there, but Christians can't make sense of, and what's not there, which Christians can't make sense of. I always... You, you've heard me say this, Paul. I'll often say, and I guess it sounds obnoxious, but it's really not. We are saying, well, that's a Christian problem. That's not a Jewish problem at all. Yeah. No, there was an assumption among the authors of that time. I mean, all of the authors are Jewish, writing mostly to other Jews in right. congregations spread across the diaspora, but nevertheless meeting in synagogues. So there was an assumption of literacy with the commentary mm -hmm. and extra biblical documents like the Talmud or the Mishnah, right? There was, right. and, and these reading these documents <clears throat> and, and understanding them and seeking to seeking to understand them doesn't mean automatically that you are equating them no. with scripture. It means you're using them to help you understand the scripture so right. that you can apply it. And, you know, just just to bring it back to book writing for a minute i think i think your book goes a long way in helping people to begin to see especially all the things that aren't there right when they read the text of the scripture um you know most noticeably for me <clears throat> has been what we've learned about the appointed times and the the the, the stars in the sky right what that yeah. means and then the calendar and the timeline that we're on and all of these things that seem very like, whoa, you know, and vague. And I've never seen stuff like that before. And it never happens in the modern world. And what is all this about? All of it becomes very relatable and accessible when you, uh, stop, you take off the horse blinders and you realize there's a ton of contextual right. additional 
content to add to this that enhances your understanding of it. So one of the things that comes to my mind, you know, when we first started this podcast, you talked about, you know, you never writing new additions, coming to new understandings, maybe adding new things, taking things out. Uh, and so many authors get stuck, I think, believing that they have to have all of their thoughts in concrete. It's never changing. And, 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 it, and, and when I've discovered the final thoughts, then I'll produce my book rather than yeah. being okay with producing their incremental understandings. How did you judge what to include, what not to include? And did you experience that sort of hurdle? That's a great question. Let me tell you, this book, Strange Gospel, is not the first book I've written. In fact, I've written a few. And I think what it starts out for me is it kind of starts out like a a journal of sorts, I guess, getting things out of my own head. I, I always refer to the scene in, in the movie Bruce Almighty where God shows Bruce that never-ending filing cabinet. Because when I talk to people, and I guess it's just the way I'm wired, strangely wired, no doubt. Things make sense in my head. I see pictures and everything connects in an endless. That's why that picture is the best way I describe it to people. And, and people started asking me, oh man, you know, do you know about this? Do you know about that? And I'm like, yeah, I, I do. And I can talk to you in a conversation and I just haphazardly speak. Kind of like Paul said earlier, assuming the audience knows things. And I've learned over the years, no, they don't know these things. And they're not all recording every conversation I have with them. So I was probably literally begged by people to start writing. And I, I mean, I've never gone for writing courses. I read extensively, yes, but I wouldn't, that's why I said I would never have considered myself an author because I think that's an achievement that takes time and effort and going through a system like you guys are the professionals in doing. So I would just sit and write and in fact, the first book I wrote is called Jesus in Context. And that book turned out to have some insane amount of pages that I didn't mind writing because literally the first process was just that. It was just writing everything I thought. And in going back to the book, and I've sold a few copies of that too, which I also need to ask people if they like chocolates or something else because I need to tell them, well, and this is the point, that book, in fact, now with hindsight, with view and getting more experience in understanding how to write or how I'd like to progress as a writer, as an author is I'm splitting it now into three different books. And that should tell you everything that I think I wrote an encyclopedia instead of a book. And I think I overdid it quite literally. So it's now turning into the idea is Jesus in context, the church in context context and the gospel in context, which are three separate books, which mm. I think possibly already fill as many pages as that one book. So I'm, I'm literally, I think, developing as a writer in that way, if I, if I could be so bold as to say that. And quite literally out of that came strange gospel. So the question is how, because in Jesus in context, I jumped everywhere. I went into the political situation in in Jerusalem in the first century. I spoke about the school of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of that, all of which is necessary. But at the end of it, I realized if people can't speed read and immediately retain everything they read, which is what I can do, then this book is written for the handful of people that are like me. And then, well, then I'm not an author. Then I've just, you know, and so to answer your question, that book has taught me that, and out of that, so there's the three books that are kind of still needing to happen when I split them up. And then in that process, it was during COVID, and I'm a huge Stranger Things fan. If you read the intro to the book, you can pick that up. I realized, wait a minute, is there a fourth book in the context series, but I'm not even going to call it in context. I'm just going to take this completely other different stream. And that's what I've done. So that's, this process is slapping, like I said, literally including this morning when I had to say to myself, oh my word, I need to add some stuff to chapter two, which is the gospel in the stars. I'm like, why didn't I put this in there the first time? You know, so I'm seeing that changing and 
it's it's quite frightening. I don't know how many editions there are going to be before it's actually a functional book, but guys like you can help me with that. So it is a learning process, and I, I think it's humbling for me. I'll tell you why it's humbling. is because I know I'm an expert on Torah. Like, the, that's settled for me. But now to convert that expertise into writing so a generalized audience of any kind can draw from it, I am an absolute, what could I call it, amoeba. I, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing, which is so frustrating because I can talk or write for hours on what I do know. So I am very much at the humbled stage of being an author. And that's why I said at the start, when you mentioned I'm an author, I'm like, oh, I don't have, I'm, I mean, I'm pretty confident when I'm talking online or to anyone really about scripture. But when you mention me as an author, I'm like, you might be being way too kind to me. <laughs> so I don't know if that answers your question there, but I'm, I'm intimidated in a good way. Well, you know, one of the goals of Emissary is, is to be ambassadors, let's say, for faith-based authors and, and amplify their messages and get, the, get their messages to a broader, you know, broader audience. And, you know, the title of this podcast, Telling the Whole Story, yeah. The root of that is something that Paul and I batted around that in the absence of facts, people make up stories for themselves. You need very few facts. You can have one little thing and we create a whole storyline. The story is automatic. It's necessary right. and it's only based on our own experience. And so we will read into a story and create up a whole life story for somebody that we saw on the street at one right. point in time. And we have now determined who they are and where they came from and where they're headed. And, and, and when, when we as writers then attempt to uh, produce all of this information, there are holes, there are gaps, particularly right. with, like you're talking about something as heavy and as meaningful, let's say, as the gospel, you know, you're not writing a, uh, you're not writing a new Harry Potter that we're just going to, you know, watch yeah. a great movie of and, you know, go to bed. Yeah. You're, you're communicating a, 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 a you're communicating a, a, a something of, of, of uh, definitive value, right? That you don't want to mess up. Uh, and I think what comes to my mind is this idea of telling the whole story. We don't get the whole story, and as a faith-based author, you have to leave room for the Holy Spirit to work. Absolutely. And and this may be meaningful. That whatever that gap is, may be, may invite the question. Whatever the discrepancy is that, you know, you come to a new understanding 15 years from now, you know, that, that may be the one thing that somebody is, is key for their experience. Right. And when we are communicating, we're not just communicating as, as individuals, we're communicating as, uh, uh, sort of pointing back, you know, pointing like, Hey, right. here's what, here's what I know. And I don't know at all. And you got to go to the source to get right. to get more and i'm willing to i'm willing to uh to, to bring this message to you as broken as it is right <laughs> and right. hope hope that you'd get something anything from it yeah well, you know you say that something that uh i teach from and, it, and it's probably not the best sales pitch for a for a rabbi for a teacher of any kind is i tell the people i teach and paul might have heard me say this once or twice is the more I learn, the less I know. Yeah. And I tell that to my students because a lot of times they say, oh my word, I want to know as much as you do. And then I would say to them, well, oh my word, I want to know as much as you think I know. <laughs> because it's a constant journey. It doesn't stop. Yeah. And for me, the greatest experience I have in developing as a teacher is hearing from people like Paul the students that I teach, the people I work with, because how much I know, it doesn't matter at all. If I can't convey it in a way that an audience can actually receive it. So when I've been, I've been told years ago in the past that I was going right over people's heads, which is then completely useless, no matter what I know, if I can't meet my audience where they're at. And for me, the easiest way to teach is in this format where we live that I, we can go back and forth. But when someone's sitting with my book in their hand, they can't just speak to the page and the page is going to give them an AI response in the moment, you know, but 
have a chat in that way. So that makes the responsibility on me even I. And as you said, I can't imagine a more important story to tell than the one I tell. Mm. Now, as a certified nerd, I love things like Stranger Things and Marvel and all of that. And I often laugh with my friends when we have serious debates about who would win in a fight between Thanos and, and the Hulk. Because it's absolute nonsense because no one could ever actually answer that for a number of reasons. And yet we get that involved in it. I don't mind getting that involved in that. But yeah, we're talking about Jesus, the one who's considered by us who believe in him to be the very word of God that spoke everything into existence. And when I tackle that kind of theme, I'm not only getting the ears up and, and nervous and ready on the Christian community, but the Jewish community who very often and online and around the world when I teach will call me a heretic mm. because for me to say that Jesus is the Messiah, they consider me to be uh, you know, a heretic within Judaism. And that's a heavy burden that I carry every day and I don't mind carrying it and I defend Jesus and will continue to. So even more so how I tell the story, it's it's the most important thing I will ever do. And as you say, you know, I'm leaving the door open that in 30 years time, there might be version, you know, edition 12 of strange gospel, if there needs to be, because to me, my reputation is worth less than honoring who Jesus is in that way. So as you say, it's, I can't imagine a more important topic to be writing on. And, and that's, I, th I think it's a good kind of intimidating. Uh, and if I can just say this, I tell you that I've read Paul and other people that I teach restructure or retell something I've taught, like on one of our groups where I do teachings on, on Telegram, for example, that I'm reading this with an excitement, can't wait to get to the end of what they're saying, completely forgetting that they are regurgitating in a good way, rephrasing something I've taught them. And to me, that's exciting for two reasons. It's so someone can comprehend what I'm saying, number one. And number two, I think there's times that people like Paul and this other guy that's on our group, Conrad, who is phenomenal at doing exactly what Paul does, these guys can write what I say better than what I say it. I don't know if I'm impressed or insulted, but Let's go with it because the point is it gets the message out. So I'm telling you literally, Jason, that when I'm reading this stuff, I'm reading it like an avid, you know, follower. Like, come on, word, what's he going to say next? This is incredible. <laughs> you know, and to me, that's a good sign. It's humbling again because I realize, no, I don't need to be the best articulator of this. And I can lean on other people who can possibly say it better than me. I, um, a couple of things came to mind as you were both talking there. Number one, uh, referring back to, you know, the possibility of having to publish different versions of this over the lifetime. One of the most profound things I ever heard, uh, this is from John Eldridge, who we've talked about in the past. Oh, yeah. He pointed out the Bible is not comprehensive. No. It doesn't talk about everything that human beings are ever going to face throughout the millennia. It's very... Uh, focused on the time and place in which it was written. And then of course you've got, that's over a span of 1500 years itself. And so what, what, what Moses was writing about was long since done and dusted established. And we've right. moved on from that by the time that, uh, John is writing revelation, you know? Oh yeah. And, and so, um, when I realized that God had decided as an author, not to be comprehensive, I said to myself, then I can write and not be comprehensive and make adjustments and improvements. And I can use that as a reference point for authors to say, you know, you, you, I, I tell all of our ghostwriting clients when they're working with me or edit editing or whatever, I tell them there has to be a point of no return where you say, okay, anything I want to change about this from, from this date forward, I save for the next version. Right. Cause you can yeah, always right. republish it. You can always release version two or version 10 or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. And the other thing that I thought of <clears throat> was, um, I like to 
I like to joke and, and say, even God uses ghostwriters. Very much. He does. He prefers to write as a team. He can write it himself. He's perfectly capable of that. Right. He's probably perfectly capable of communicating it perfectly in writing in exactly the way we would understand, but he chooses not to. His, his philosophy seems to be, oh, I could write this myself, but boy, have you, have you seen how Matthew writes? I right. think I'm going to, I think I'm going to use that. I, th that that's useful to me. I, and, and, you know, and besides I got more important things to focus on. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I like, you know, precisely, you know, what I would say rabbi is that every author we have worked with who has collaborated with me either as a ghostwriter or just as an editor on what they have written have said, has said the same, essentially the same thing. They say, I don't know why I didn't think of that, but that section that you added there, or that idea that you came up with for expressing what we, what we're trying to communicate is brilliant. Yeah. And I'm, uh, and I'm sitting here thinking the only reason I came up with it was because of how you explained it to me verbally. Exactly. So when you're reading the posts that I'm writing on social media and you're like, you're, you're enjoying how that's being amplified. That's what, that's a big thing we try to get across to people, uh, in persuading them to publish with us because we're saying, look, that skill set is, is, is built into what we do. In fact, Jason had the same thing, right? His book, you can see on the, on the shelf behind him, uh, he had been struggling to write a book for 10 years. And then he came to me as a coaching client at first. And when we, I mean, I loved what he was writing. And then I would read these parts and I'd say, you know what this reminds me of? And I'd regurgitate a quote that he hadn't read for like 10 years, but he knew it. But, right. And he would say, that's, that's exactly what I needed for this. And then he threw it into the, into his manuscript. And now it's in there to this day. And it's right. like, it, it just enhances right. the flavor. So. Right. And I think for me, as I said earlier, I'm absolutely confident in holding my own in talking in a live debate or answering questions on the spot with people. I can do that comfortably. But when you ask me to put pen to paper in some formal, permanent, long-standing way, I do get, when I say intimidated, it's because I've learned to understand that the way my brain processes things is not the way everyone else process, processes things. Yeah. And again, it's selfish and immature of me to expect everyone to reason out the way I do. And I'll give you a little bit of a story about that. One of the most repetitive phrases my mom used with me as a child, bearing in mind I'm autistic, was that why do I, I've got to be careful of talking as if I'm above everybody else. Hmm. And I never understood that because what I would say when I spoke to adults was, and this being a child, now just do imagine this happened from about five or six years old already. I would say to adults, well, obviously you understand this. Mm. And the truth is, when you have a better knowledge of certain subjects and even adults, it doesn't go down well when you firstly assume they know it and then you leave egg on their face because they don't know it. Yeah. And it's embarrassing for them to admit. And that's probably one of the hardest lessons I've learned is to stop assuming everyone thinks like I do and can articulate the way I do and the way I speak for it not to come across as sounding obnoxious and, and all the rest of it. And mm. again, that was a, a maturity thing for me that I've, I'm probably still busy learning, actually. And I think the writing process is what helps so much because I've often been told, even on Quora, you know, I just asked you one question. Why did you write a thesis to me now? <laughs> and I'm still trying to navigate between, okay, when do I get to express myself fully versus I need to tone that down. And I think that's why I love Moses as an, as an author. To, to be honest with you, I think Moses wasn't a very good author. And why I say that is because he's left so much work for me to do when I'm teaching people to explain, okay, here's why you mustn't stand. He chose that story. Why did that there? Why he drops the story of this right in the middle of that portion there? which is what people pick up sometimes. They're like, why would he drop that in there? Or yeah. even your namesake, Paul, Rabbi Paul. I mean, when I, when I get to see him in eternity, I'm going to ask him for royalties because the time <laughs> I've had to spend 
trying to say, okay, yes, you got to understand when a person like Paul, a lawyer in Judaism and Torah speaks, why he will do what he, and you know, Paul, we spoke the other day about how he spoke to Peter and said to Peter, you, you live like a Jew, but you act like a Gentile and you want Gentiles to live like Jews. Yeah, I was, I, I was really confused by that one. Right. And I would love to have answered that question in one or two lines, but as you know, I wrote a thesis in trying to answer that for you. And even at the end of all of that, as much as I enjoyed it, I was like, oh man, did I do too much again? I'm going to have to ask everyone, did any of that make sense? Because I might've confused you more than you were before. So it's, it's again, it's humbling. And, you know, I've just been sitting and thinking from the first time you told me that story of God as ghost writers, you know what I thought to myself? I'm like, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> that is a book title, like God's ghost writers. What a way to tackle the authors of scripture in a way that, that can be less intimidating in terms of I'm so far separate from these authors. So that proves your very point of why it is necessary to get outside opinion. So um, I'm hoping you up for the challenge of writing a book with me that will maybe have that title. Just say when, just say when, my friend. I love it. I love, I love our interaction and your answers are never too long for me, but that's because I'm also like you. I'm like, I need the thesis. Right. If the gaps are left open, I fill them in on my own, like Jason says. And I make up some pretty bizarre ideas of what actually went on, you know, and, and, and that's to say, um, there's, there's, there's good ways to do that in bad ways. You know, we, we could look at, uh, in film, for example, how, how universally admired, uh, the, the chosen, uh, doc uh, series right. is right. Because it's a, it's making a, a very considerate effort to have all of the proper context and cultural background. Right. It, it, it does have to use more contemporary dialogues so that the yes. viewers will understand it, but it does it in a way that honors and recognizes there was a context behind all these stories you read and they didn't just right. happen out of the blue. And Jesus wasn't just walking along the shore and there's Peter standing there and the two of them have never met. They don't know who each other are. There's no context. And he says, follow me. And Peter says, okay, right. I, yeah. Yeah. I like, yeah. I hated that. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. I don't care if you believe in magic and fairies and all that. Yeah. The way they present it is, oh no, these guys sort of knew each other. You know, they had fellow, they, they had friends who knew each other. They were in a, they lived in a similar area. There was probably some degree of familiarity. And then they finally meet. That's much more true to the human experience. Logic, yeah. So I, I just like when when those details get filled in authentically and correctly, and not just using our imagination or casting it as you know um, magic spells or whatever. Um, yeah, I pay attention. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Jason, well, can I just add something onto what you said because I want to get your yeah. opinion on this specifically? Because when you said it, I was like. I wanted to say, Jason, are you aware of this? And you might be, but it's, well, then for the viewers, at least it's, it's beneficial. When you spoke about that filling in the gaps, I wanted to say to you, but I didn't want to interrupt at the time, is to say, do you know that you literally just described the Mishnah, the Gemara, you've described the Mashal, which is the parable you've described. You've pretty much described the Bible. And I don't think people always get that because that's what's going on in scripture is that those extra tidbits are being put in. That colorful language is literally being put into the text. And if I can give one example that I always use that is quite effective with Christians, and I get the fear of elevating non-biblical writings to the level of the Bible, and I get that that's a defense that they should look for. But I often tell them when they careful of that. I'm like, well, what could you do if I told you that in your Bible, there's stuff that's not from the Bible, which yeah. they take I mean, to comprehend. And then I go to either Paul, Rabbi Paul, who speaks and quotes Greek philosophers, quite honestly, but more directly because it's more startling to them. Because And I need to get their attention on that. Is I point to Jude yeah. and Peter, yeah. who quote from books like Enoch and Jasher. And I say to them, when they speak of these angels, which tends to be the topic in Strange Gospel, 
can you point out to me where Moses wrote about that? And it's a mm. startling moment for them to realize, oops, what I call the Bible has stuff that's filling in those gaps. And I know that's a complicated process. And that's again, where professionals like yourself do have to come in because how much of that is too much? And that is the chosen's challenge too, is how far can we push that before we lose the audience too? So I just want yeah. to get your thoughts on that, Jason. Uh, like you, if you if you know much about the Mishnah and Gemara and what we do with all of that, I do know a little bit about that. Um, what connects with me in what we're talking about is this concept, I, and I'm gonna I, I don't remember who said this quote, so I'm, I don't have the attribution with me handy. But a, the quote goes like this: "Am I willing at this time to make the effort required to make a positive difference on this topic?" Am I willing at this time to make the effort required to make a positive difference on this topic? Now, I use that as a filtering mechanism because I used to speak into every conversation because I had something to say. Right. And then I realized, wait a second. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got an opinion and everybody's opinion stinks. And, uh, and, and, and I used it as a filtering mechanism. Am I willing at this time? There are times and there are not times right. to make the effort required right? To make a positive difference on stuff. And, and I, and as it applies to writing and this idea of telling the whole story and, you know, in particular things that you're talking about, you know, weighty topics where we want to communicate the whole story. Sometimes when we've not given enough effort, we've not given enough information, the difference cannot be made. We, it is, right. well, it's incomplete. We left the person hanging. We didn't right. explain the end. And now everybody's worse off. Yeah. However, sometimes, and, and this is just maybe part, part, part experience and maybe part inviting other people into the process, the writing process of being an author is figuring out how far do I need to take this right. to make the point and then stop. Yeah. You know, I couple that with the, the other saying, and I'm not, I think I don't know if it was Ben Franklin or something like that, who said, uh, when the horse is dead, dismount. <laughs> and Right. And, and so there's kind of those competing, there, there are those competing right. sides. And, uh, um, I, I, I think of, um, talking to my kids. I love my kids. My kids are also in their young twenties and a little lower. And sometimes they will say something that is, uh, so, so not true. And also not worth correcting. Yeah. <laughs> and so I take no exception with it <laughs> because there's no amount of explanation I could give you. It's like telling a kid, Hey, you're, you know, you'll, you'll know when you grow up. It's like, or you'll know when you'll become a parent. It's like, to, it's a totally ineffective thing to say to a kid. That's right. It's basically saying, how stupid are you? That's and right. to know, and to no real effect, uh, except to leave with like, well, but I can't know. And I think as it relates to authorship, this idea of telling the whole story, the determination of how much to say and when to withhold, how much to put into a second edition, how much to build as a foundation versus adding flourishes is not, it, I don't think it's something that can be done in isolation. I think it has to be done in a community. And if we want to tie that into you know, all this topic about the Bible and such, uh, it a person's testimony about themselves is nearly useless. Other people's testimony about them. Right. Yeah. Very valuable. Do that over thousands of years and many authors. And now you have something that's irrefutable. So, uh, God, God might be choosing ghost writing, uh, because, <laughs> because he already did the work of creating all this stuff. Now he needs, uh, now he's, He's like, right. okay, now what do you have to say about this? And it turns out there's something very profound to say from all of our stories. Yeah. You, you know, Jason, what you're saying again, it's maybe someone will say, I'm just seeing things that aren't there because I'm biased to see it. The minute you said this part that you said about basically not over explaining and I, I was sort of saying being jealous with your knowledge, which is effectively what I think maturing just as an adult is part of takes me back to jesus words don't cast the pearls before the swine yeah and in judaism 
that is Torah. And you know what's brilliant is some of the students, I have the one student in particular, Nande, that's, that Paul also knows, laughs at times because he's often pulled me into discussions with other people of different faiths and whatever who get very aggressive about why the Bible's wrong or why it's this or that. And in the conversation, mainly I guess for Nande, for him to know that I'm dropping out now because this is a waste of time, as you've noted when you realize that, I would say, yeah, you know, I just love pills too much. I don't even need to use the full descriptor of Jesus in the text. And Nande wouldn't burst out laughing in the moment. He's controlled enough not to do that. But after he'd say to me, did you do what I thought you did there? Are you defending Torah and you dropped that hint for me because I know enough? I said, well done. That's exactly yeah. what I did. And he's learning the same skill. And he said to me, He's losing that desire to win every debate. Yeah. To give it up for the love of Torah and truth and to say, I'm not casting pills before the pigs here in, in this moment. So, and that's exactly what you're saying. And so, I mean, that is a general rule of being an adult, I guess, anyone should be able to say, where I'm a little bit biased and I'm saying, man, Jason's talking like a Jewish rabbi there now. <laughs> Well, I am a Jew, so we'll leave it at that. But <laughs> the, <laughs> but I, I think it's, it's a general rule of relationships, right? And if, and if books bring us into relationship with one another in some capacity, oh. one of the general rules of relationships is sometimes you can choose to be right or you can choose to have a relationship. And yeah. right might take care of itself over time, uh, whereas relationships can come to abrupt ends. Yeah. Yes. I was thinking there of... Uh... <clears throat> Dallas Willard, who said, um, who gave an example just like that rabbi, he was teaching a class at seminary and a student, um, got rather contentious with him about a point he was trying to get across. And he said, uh, and then the bell rang and he said, okay, see you next week. Then he didn't finish it. And one of the other students who watched this came up to him and said, Hey, he was he was, he was being obnoxious there. He was getting in your face. How come you didn't respond to him? And he said, and the, the old man said, I was practicing the discipline of not having the last word. Wow. I'm like, and that's, a, ah. that's a skill. That is a skill that perhaps later than what I should have learned, I am beginning to learn it too. Yeah. Not to have to have the last word. And as Jason, as you said, I'm realizing too, especially as a rabbi, that sometimes the relationship for me in the long run is turning out to be of greater value than being right in the moment. And mm -hmm. that's not easy to do when you're an intellectual. It, that <laughs> takes a bit of work to hold back the floodgates, you know, of, of no, wait, but you're not seeing this yet. Yeah. Uh, that's the goal. That's, that's honestly what I'd like to be, to be a mature uh, rabbi, if I can call it that. Well, you, you and I, uh, don't know each other. Well, I'm a little bit behind the curve here, uh, for Paul, but I too have walked and I'm walking that road. Uh, and, uh, perhaps on a, at a different time, we can regale each other with stories of how we are learning oh, that <laughs> with a lot of them to go around. <laughs> yes. Well, this is an absolute blast talking to you about these topics. Uh, you know, your, your book, Strange Gospel, I'm, I'm really digging into that. Um, I was intrigued when you said, Hey, I'm a Stranger Things fan. And, you know, I saw that uh, for, cause first I saw the title of that and I was like, that's Stranger Things. And I was right. like, wait a second. Right. And then as I dug into it, I was like, Oh, that's interesting. Right. To, to split the two there, but it's great to unpack that with you. And also this concept of telling the whole story. What do you need to say? What do you need to withhold? How do you make those determinations and who do you make those with? I think it's so important. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, in a, in, in the same spirit, Rabbi, grateful for your, uh, your company and your time and to dig into your book and this all important concept as it relates to authorship. And, uh, for those of you joining us, looking forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Emissary Authors Podcast. My name is Paul Edwards. This is my co-host, Jason Todd. We've been talking with Rabbi Darren Katz about his book, Strange Gospel, and we will look forward to seeing you again soon.